Hello everyone. Not that long ago, I remember talking to a man who was the rear gunner in a B-29 gunship. The, the big bombers that they started coming out with at the end of World War II. There were five turrets on those gunships. Uh, two at the top, two in the uh, underneath, one in the rear. And he was the one, he was the rear gunner, and he said he had a 50 caliber machine gun, if I remember right, and a cannon that was all part of his armament. And it was a very, very tight space. I was able to get into one and see down there, but there's no way I wanted to crawl in there. And it was very, very tight. And he said he was in many situations where uh, enemy fighters were coming in, and he had to try to do his best to shoot them down. And bullets were whizzing in, and many, many, many of them did not make it out alive. Many of them uh, were shot down. But anyway, he was very aware of being in a real battle. But unless you've been a veteran from Iraq or some other place uh, in recent years, Afghanistan, some of the other places we've been, unless you've been a veteran, maybe from Vietnam or Korea, you, you wouldn't really have an idea of what being in a real battle was like. I haven't been. I remember growing up in the Philippines and, and going up in the jungles behind our, my father's place and finding these old foxholes still full of old bullet shells. And we would collect those and try to get scrap metal uh, prices for them. Anyway, but we have been called to be part of a battle, a very real battle, even more serious, even more serious than a real live battle with bullets whizzing around you. Are you aware of that? I'm giving this sermon because I began to realize that I was slipping from my awareness of it. I was becoming Laodicean. I was becoming more lukewarm in my beliefs. And I wasn't fighting, fighting, fighting temptations and sins and attitudes as badly and strongly as I should have. So I started making this own study. Am I winning the fight of my life? Are you? And that's the sermon today. So some of you don't like the metaphor of being a soldier or being in a war or fighting, and you think that's anti-Christian or something like that. Well, I'm going to show you. Uh, well, first of all, so we're going to go through that today. So first of all, being aware of the fight we've been called to be a part of. Are you aware that many of the great men and women of the Bible uh, from ancient times were excellent warriors? Abraham, in his aging life, in his older, in his older age, uh, went out to save his cousin, or I'm sorry, his nephew Lot. That story is in Genesis 14. And he went against what was a rising empire at that time. And with his 300 uh, trained soldiers, trained uh, servants in his own household, he went out and defeated them, surprised them, and defeated them by God's help, I'm sure. Moses was a great fighter, known for that. Joshua and Caleb. But anyway, Jael got a tent peg and put it right in the head of, of the enemy. Deborah, uh, when uh, the, uh, the Israelite leader Barak wouldn't uh, go unless, unless Deborah went with him. And so he, so she became a great leader, a great fighter. She was willing to fight, and with God's help, and she called on God's help and so forth. Gideon certainly was a great one of God. King David, many, many others. Esther, uh, in her own way, in her own feminine way, fought, stood up for the Jewish people when her, when her own life was put at stake. Now, those were physical battles. But I'm just saying we come from a heritage of, of prophets and leaders and kings before us and people like Esther and even Mary, for that matter, and others who were great people standing up for what was right. We have been called to fight. I'm going to show you that. And we have to be aware of that fight. I'm really concerned that many of us are not that aware. So hello, children of the highest, members of the household of Abba, and brothers and sisters of the Messiah. Welcome to Light on the Rock. I'm Philip Shields, the host and founder of Light on the Rock. I hope you get a lot out of today's sermon. And if you do, I hope you tell others about it and help us get the word out about this website. Today I'm talking about winning the fight of your life. I hope you'll feel free to leave comments uh, in, uh, after the sermon, uh, you know, in our sermons. I'd love, to, I'd love to see what people are thinking and saying. So yes, you and I have been called to be part of a very high calling and to fight the temptation to give up, to fight the temptation to sin, to fight the temptation to go back to what we once were. That's me, that's you, that's all of us. So don't get sidetracked. 
into, uh, on the other hand, becoming a co-slanderer with the devil in slandering others and fighting others who are called children of God. You will be held accountable for that if you do. We have to, all of us, come together as children of God and fight the fight we've been called to fight. Scripture is clear about that. Paul talks about putting on the whole armor of God and in that armor, standing up in the power of his might in Ephesians 6 against the devil and against sins and the thoughts that he puts in. He tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, verses 11 and 12, But you, O man of God, flee the things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Now look at verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. It's a fight of faith. In fact, our shield of faith, above all, take grasp, take a hold of that shield of faith. And that shield was often a full body shield. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. He says in 1 Timothy 1, 18 to 20, 1, 18 to 19, I should say, uh, I'm reading here from the Holman Bible, the Apologetics Bible. Let me just make a little note here. Timothy, my child, I'm giving you this instruction in keeping with my prophecies or the prophecies previously made about you so that by them you may strongly engage in battle. In battle. Again, he talks about the shield of faith, having faith and a good conscience. And because some have rejected this battle and this shield of faith and the good conscience, they have suffered shipwreck of their faith. Uh, New King James says uh, that you may wage the good warfare. The uh, complete Jewish Bibles and others say that you may fight the good fight. Okay, fight the good fight. You may strongly engage in battle, okay? Um, anyway, so you see... The same Paul who spoke of having the righteousness of God uh, given to us by faith, uh, that we still have a fight to do. We are saved by grace. We're rewarded by works. We're saved by grace. But that gives us a responsibility and a privilege of fighting for what we've been saved for and, and being in that fight with our Savior. We have been purchased and redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. So if we're owned by Yeshua, that means we have to obey Yeshua and live the kind of life he was called to live and that he's now living, hopefully, in you, you and me. In 2 Timothy 2, let's turn there now. 2 Timothy 2, I'll put it on the board. Verses 3 to 5, you must therefore endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. As a good soldier. No one engaged in warfare you see, I mean, this whole topic of being a soldier of God is right in the Bible. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And then also in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 5, um, here we're told, uh, do not war uh, according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare, our warfare are not carnal or fleshly, but mighty in God. Again, you're going to see this phrasing, in God, in his name, by his power, okay, in his might. Mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments. Everything you have that comes against you and arguing against being a, a, a Christian soldier, you've got to cast it down. Any thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought we're supposed to be aware of every thought going in. Uh, this song we're listening to is putting thoughts in our head. This movie we're watching is putting words and thoughts into our head, concepts into our head. Are these the thoughts we want to be putting in? He says, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. That's what we're called to do now. And so to get back, uh, we need to get battle seasoned, I'll tell you, because once we know how to fight the wrong thoughts, you and I are going to be given dozens and thousands of wrong thoughts when the Great Tribulation begins to come upon, uh, even the time before the Great Tribulation. It's going to be a time of trouble. In one of his discourses, Yeshua says, and before all that time happens, before that, you will be called up and be put in prison or be called into courts and all of that 
before the Great Tribulation, he says. I'm wondering if we could stand up as bravely as 27-year-old at the time, Miriam Ibrahim, a Sudanese woman who became a Christian and married a Christian. And because of that, she was pregnant. She was pregnant uh, when, they, when they indicted her and sentenced her to 100 lashes for adultery. They called it adultery because she'd married a Christian man and they didn't acknowledge that. And then she was going to be hanged or put to death because of giving up the Muslim faith. Thankfully, enough people stood in the gap for her, stood up, said something, did something. I wish I had of. I wish I was aware of it at the time. Enough people called on their governments to protest, to, to say something. She finally was released. But I'm wondering if we, and every time they brought her up before the court, she kept saying, I am a Christian and I will never give up my, my, my belief in Christ and being a Christian, even though she was facing 100 lashes. Now, in times like that, if the deliverance didn't come, there were many who were not delivered in Sudan, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan. This is going on around the world, in Iraq, in Mosul, which was ancient Nineveh. Uh, the, the ISIS uh, troops came in there and so brutalized the Christians, they all fled. So how many of us could stand up and not feel dis discouraged and depressed? Well, where are you, God? Why aren't you in involving yourself? So we have to learn all that and get battle season now. Now, just before Christ returns, and it could be, I think, within a decade, within this decade, Maybe by 2030. I don't know. But I'm thinking it's pretty soon now. I don't know. It doesn't matter when it is. Be ready. Be battle seasoned. Religious persecution certainly will heat up like never seen before. If you speak up or don't adhere to the new uh, wokeness coming up out there, accepting uh, gay marriage, accepting LGBTQ, accepting the Marxist movements, in Black Lives Matter and others, and everything they're standing for, if you don't do that, you are going to be the one condemned. The things that used to be accepted are now being condemned. We need to be ready for it. Satan doesn't want you in his kingdom, in God's kingdom, I mean, and he's doing everything in his power to discourage you and to get you down. We have to get into the fight. We're not fighting people. We're not fighting people. We're fighting people that Satan uses. We're fighting the concept Satan uses, but not the people. We're fighting the power behind that. That's what I'm trying to say. The people are not the real enemy. They're not the real enemy. They're just vessels that he infects and uses. And we've got to see we're in a real fight and must surely feel and recognize the real fight that we're in. My title is Win the Fight of Your Life. Keep in mind, you have been called to a high calling again, okay? Why is this so important? It's important because God the Father has to know where you stand. He has to know how willing you are to stand up for him, no matter what comes against you, no matter what he sends against you. And so when we pray and study God's word and learn of God's way, do we obey what we're reading in God's word? The word is the sword. Do we obey? That's what Paul said, but, you know, take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Anyway, do we obey God's word? Do we obey what we're being shown? Do we, or do we forget what God's word is showing us? Our commander-in-chief, Yeshua, has come to take over his army. When Jericho was about to be attacked, Joshua went out there one time and looking around, and this man stood in front of him, and he said, Who are you? Are you for us or are you against us? And he says, I'm not for or against. I've come as commander. Commander. I think that's in Joshua 5. I think it is. don't have that in my notes, but in Joshua 5, I've got, I think that's where it is. I've come as commander of the armies of the Lord of hosts. That was the one who became Yeshua probably later on. He wants to know we're going to obey him. And so Joshua said, what, do you have, what orders do you have for me? And basically took off his sandals because he was in the presence of God. You can read that in Joshua 5, I'm pretty sure. John 14, verse 15, Yeshua, the commander of us, our lives, says, the Lord of our lives, the ones we said at baptism, yes, I will come under his rulership. Yes, I've repented of sin, which is breaking God's commandments. And I've accepted Jesus as my personal Savior and my Lord and King. We said that at baptism, did we not? I did. 
I don't know if I fully understood it then as an 18 year old, but I hope you do. John 14 verse 15, Yeshua says, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 15, John 14, 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Now God loves us so much that if we start breaking his commandments, start walking away from God, we are going to receive a spanking that Hebrews talks about. He is going to let us go through sore trials. He is going to let us um, go through the refining process. I'll speak more about that in a minute. So we have to come to the point where we prove our love for God and for Yeshua by as we read that word every day, doing what the word says. <clears throat> the only way we can claim to belong to Christ is to, and to love the Messiah is to prove it by opening the doors to let him live inside of me and you. Let him live. We all fail in that from time to time. I certainly do. And I do, but we have to repent and get back in the fight and get on our knees and say, Father in heaven, I want to open the door to your son, Yeshua. I want you to be in my life, to live your resurrected life again in me. It's a fight. The fight, the, the fight frankly, is more a fight to stay close to God, not let anything pull you away. The fight, frankly, is more to abide in him. Let my words abide in you. And he said, he who abides in me in John 15, 5, will bear much fruit. And so that's the real battle, is doing everything in our power to keep abiding in him. In 1 John 2, verses 3 to 6, anybody who claims that they know Christ, that they, are, that they know him and all that, must live like he lived. So 1 John 2, verses 3 to 6 says, Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and doesn't keep his commandments is a liar. So remember that. 1 John 2, verse 3 and 4 there. Verse 5 now. Whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. We have to obey. We have to stand up. We have to fight sin. To keep the commandments means we have to fight the temptations to break the commandments, whether it's a little lie, or whether it's a little lusting, or whether it's coveting, or whether it's being too, too lackadaisical on the Sabbath, whether we start using God's name in vain. Some of you are starting to say, oh my gee, oh my, you know, too much. Wait, you shouldn't do it at all. Many of you are starting to use the F words in your, in your, uh, in your sentences. Stop it. That's not of God. You've got to reject that. Stand up for him. You've got to fight that. We've got to do what God says. We've got to talk and act like, like Jesus would, like Yeshua would if he were here. He is inside of us, inside of you. He, let him out. Let him rule in your life. 1 John 2 verse 5, Whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we're in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Now, I can't walk just like Jesus walked unless I open the door to let him do it inside of me, through me. People will see me. I'll, people will see you and the, what you're saying and acting. But hopefully it's the life of Christ that they see. So to keep all, to keep all the commandments takes resisting the thoughts and the temptations and the attitudes to break them, to, get, to be easy on them. If we aren't vigorously fighting sin bad attitudes and temptations. If we're not vigorously doing that, how is God going to know for sure that we're part of his kingdom? Here's another thought. In Luke 21, verses 34 to 36, Yeshua says in a few places, in fact, that if, we, if, if God considers us worthy and he knows us, he knows who we are and what we're standing for and what we're fighting for, that he very well might decide, so I don't know that it's a guarantee, but it's a to let us skip the great tribulation. Look at this in Luke 31, Luke 21, verses 34 and 36. Take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing and drunkenness. Stop that. Cares, worries, concerns of this life. And that day come on you unexpectedly. What day? The day of the Lord, the day of the coming of Christ. It will come as a snare. Suddenly, quickly, boom, you're there. And all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth... Watch you therefore and pray always 
so that you may be counted worthy to escape. Pray always that you be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. I hope you're praying that prayer. But I think if we are fighting sin, if we're in the battle, if we're standing up for right, speaking up for right, not just cowering in the distance, I think the chance has improved greatly that we will be spared the things to come. In the last two church, uh, church groups or churches, congregations of Revelation 2 and 3, in Revelation 3, the last two were Philadelphia and Laodicea. Christ is speaking. He seems much more pleased with Philadelphia. And at the end of the section on Philadelphia, Revelation 3, verses 10 to 11, I don't mean Philadelphia here in the States. I mean Philadelphia in what used to be, or what is, Turkey. Because you've kept my command to persevere, I will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world. Because of this, I will keep you from having to go through the hour of trial. That shall come upon the whole face of the world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I'm coming quickly. So it's spoken to people who exist at a time just before his return. Laodiceans, on the other hand, in the last of the seven churches, are told to buy from Christ gold and silver refined, gold refined in the fire, implying a very seriously terrible time because he doesn't see them the way they should be seen as uh, holy and fervent and persevering. Let's read it. Revelation 3, verses 17 to 19. To the angel of the church, to the messenger of the church in Laodicea, write, to the amen, the amen, I mean, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. I'm reading from the Holman Bible. The originator of the, whole, of the God's creation says, I know your works. You're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other. I wish you were hot or cold. So because you're lukewarm, you're neither hot nor cold. You're not exactly zealous. You're not exactly part of the world. You're somewhere in between, he says. I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I'm rich. I'm okay. I'm okay. You're okay. I'm rich. I'm increased with goods. I don't need anything. God's been blessing me. He says, he's blessing me. I must be good. And yet you don't know that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I added some commentary as I was reading there. I hope you realize. I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. You're going to go through a seriously hot, terrible trial. He says, buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich. And, and put on and buy, get from me white clothes, symbolic of righteousness, his righteousness. So you may be dressed in the shameful nakedness that you have not be exposed. An ointment to spread on your eyes so you may not, so you may see. Why were they naked? Well, they probably take, repented. They'd taken off the dirty clothes of sin. But in their lukewarmness, they hadn't bothered going all the way and putting on the righteousness that God would offer them. When you went to weddings back then, the, the kings and the wealthy people, they provided the tuxedos and the garments for the people. And if you didn't put those on and just came in your jeans, that was considered very, very, it, it was a snub. It was horrible. So to both churches and to all seven churches, the admonition it, beyond that goes on to say, to those who overcome, I will do this, I will do that. To those who overcome, Read the end of every one of those, okay? At the latest see of Revelation 3, 20, 21, to the victor, he says, if you open the door and knock with uh, open the door, I'll come and have dinner with you. To the victor, to the ones who overcome, verse 21, I will give him the right to sit with me. This is again out of the Holman translation, to sit with me on my throne. Just as I have won the victory, just like I've overcome. Yeshua speaking. He never sinned, but he had to fight sin. He had to fight temptation, probably harder than uh, harder temptations than you and I ever have faced. He faced them all. I've overcome. I've won the victory. I've sat down with my father on his throne. You overcome, I'll let you sit on my throne, he said. To the Philadelphians, verse 12, Revelation 3, 12. To those who overcome, to the victor, I will make him a pillar 
in the sanctuary of my God, out of the Holy of Holies. And God will put all these names, the name of the city of my God, the name of the new Jerusalem, and my new name. To Thyatira, Revelation 2.26, to the victor, to the overcomer, I will give him authority to rule the nations. That's going to take a fight to be an overcomer, to come up over the temptations and the laziness and the lukewarmness and the la di da lay to see an attitude that so many of us get into. Now, against whom are we really fighting? I've been speaking on this for quite a while, but I, I've got to say it again. It's not people. Our fight is not against people, no matter how bad they get, no matter if a guy's torturing you. He's not your enemy, believe it or not. He's being used by Satan and his demons. That's our enemy. We are to love our human enemies. We are to love our enemies. Pray for them. Pray that God bless them. I prayed for a woman who is attacking right now in various ways and just prayed for her that God will forgive her and that God will bless her because she can't be happy. But anyway, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against spiritual powers in high places. Um, I'm going to make a note here just a second. Any human we may be fighting may be ourselves. The remaining carnal nature is still in us, but our main enemy is Satan. The main human we're fighting is really our own nature. But are you conscious of those bullets whizzing by and that you're fighting them off? Now, beyond that, though, let me first say this. If you think you can take on Satan and his demons yourself, you need to wake up. They are so incredibly powerful, you cannot defeat Satan by yourself. You cannot. Will we defeat him? Absolutely. But not by ourselves. But if you learn to be in Christ, and Christ in you and me, then absolutely, yes, Yeshua, the Son of God, makes demons and makes us Satan tremble when he shows up because he's very God. He's Son of God. They have to obey him. I know in Luke 8, in Luke 4 and Luke 8, in Luke 8, uh, there were some demons in this guy named Legion, and they were terrified. Are, are you coming to punish us now? Please, don't send us into the deep, into the abyss, please. Apparently, there's some really bad angels in a place called the abyss that you can read about in Revelation 9 who get released. And then in Luke 4, verses 33 to 36, again, they absolutely, obviously knew Yeshua was the Son of God, and we're terrified of him. So he is now in me. And he is now in you, if you have the Holy Spirit flowing in you. This is such an important point to grasp. If you're trying to fight sin, temptations, depression, bad attitudes, being sidetracked, worrying without a conscious calling out to God to fight with you, for you, ahead of you, you're missing it. There was a time... When Christ's disciples, he sent out his disciples to preach the kingdom of God. And when they came back, many were healed, many were... Let's look at it in Luke 10, verses 17 to 20. Notice an important phrase we have to learn. Luke 10, verses 17 to 20. And then the 70 returned with joy when they came back, said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. In your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. The first time Satan attacked God, way back, back, probably billions of years ago. Uh, he was cast down. He's going to do it again. It's going to be cast down again. Perhaps that will also be partly the reason why so much will be happening in the cosmos and stars and all that, because Satan being cast out. But anyway, my point is, Let's see what he says, verse 19. <clears throat> Behold, I give you authority. I, Christ, give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. He hasn't changed the topic from Satan, folks. He's still talking about Satan and demons and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Serpents, the serpent of old, Satan, you know, he's still talking about power over demons here. 
But don't rejoice in this that the spirits are subject to you. See, that's his topic. But rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So our battles are against Satan. They're never against that wife or husband doing a nasty divorce with you or that boss trying to fire you or has fired you or accusing you of wrong things or your neighbor doing wrong things. Uh, our, our fight is not really the humans there, but the spirit behind them. Spirits, real beings behind them. So did you catch that phrase, in his name? Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Luke 10, verse 17. That's the power in the war that we have, is in his name. By the way, when, okay, so anyway, so let's, uh, in Mark 16, 17, he says that uh, uh, for those who believe in my name, you shall cast out demons, heal the sick, and so on. I believe we're seeing Satan's activity very powerfully already, even in America and Europe and other places around the world. Things have just too suddenly to blame it just on the Wuhan virus. Uh, there's more going on. Satan's been released. Satan's been cast down. The demonic activity, demonic thoughts are very active. You're going to find more and more coming against you who are listening to demonic thoughts. And you've got to pray for them, that God will wake them up and cast out the demon that's in them or influencing them. That's what I'm doing. It's demonic activity that we're seeing far, far more. Satan came, the, 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 the thief came to steal, to kill and destroy and that's what we're seeing them doing in city after city, uh, especially the, the liberal cities that don't believe in law, that want to defund the police, that want to get rid of ICE, that want to get rid of borders. I sure hope none of you are buying into that, that kind of stuff. The one who's coming to steal, kill, and destroy, the, the spirit behind that, Yeshua said in John 10.10, 10, is Satan. Satan came I mean, to kill, steal, and, to steal, kill, and destroy. Christ came that we might have life, have it abundantly, not turn, not burn down buildings and businesses and destroy and attack. That's not God. But don't fear the evil spirit world. Do understand you need the power of God, though, in his name to have authority over them. In Daniel 10, even a very powerful holy angel, when Daniel was seeking God, uh, a, a, an angel was sent to talk to Daniel and this good angel was stopped by a demonic power called the king of Persia. It wasn't the king of Persia they were talking about, but it was the demonic power behind him. And he stopped this angel from getting through for three weeks and until Michael, the archangel, the, uh, the prince, princely angel, came and uh, then they backed off. So there seems to be a hierarchy and a different level of powers between these good and bad angels. So if you think you can fight angel, uh, demonic activity by yourself, you're kidding yourself. Not even a holy angel could, is what I'm saying. So in Daniel 10, 10 verses 12 to 14, don't fear Daniel from the first day you set your heart to understand, to humble yourself before your God. Your words were word, and I've come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, he's talking about a demonic uh, being here, Daniel 10, 13, withstood me in bold here, who stood me 21 days until Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. There's a, How many of these battles are going on in your behalf, in my behalf, in God's behalf, that we never see? These battles that are being waged right now. You and I need to be aware of that and be aware that when they're putting thoughts into your head that you wonder where that bad attitude came from, where that sinful thought came from. It came from Satan. He's trying to destroy us. He's trying to humiliate us. So we're told by Paul in Ephesians 6, verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be, st be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor, the whole armor, not just part of it. Don't just go out there in your underwear every day, spiritually speaking. You've got to get up, grab the shield of faith, put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. Gird, your, gird yourself. Uh, with, what, what is it, the belt of truth and whatever else is mentioned there. Put on the whole armor of God. Put on your sandals, the boots on your feet. We're to fight, yes, but not in our power. Because it says in Ephesians 10, verse 6, verse 10, that uh, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. 
Be strong in the Lord. So we've got to every day be seeking God, activating him, communing with him, letting him flow inside of us. And I was letting that down a bit. And I suspect many of you have been. Let's stop it. Let's get, be strong in the Lord, the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against, not people, but the wiles of the devil. So yes, we are supposed to fight, but not by our own power, not by our own might. Activate God in you. Do what, do what he wants you to do. You do that by constant communion. I must give a whole sermon sometime on the whole armor of God. But do we even pick up our sword every single day, which is the word of God? Are we in the Bible every single day? If you're not, you're going out there without your gun, without your sword, without your bazooka, okay? That's your sword. And as we fill our minds with God's word, much more on this in part two coming up, how we do this war. And then those thoughts come back to us when we're faced with different things by the Holy Spirit bringing them to mind. We defeat Satan by God's Holy Spirit flowing in us and, and, and flowing his word into our minds so we have something to fight. That's what Jesus did when he fought Satan. It is written all three times. It is written. Now listen to your temptations. God's word says, boom, and he attacks Satan back. In verse, six, uh, verse 17, Ephesians 6, 17, take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit. The sword of God's Spirit inside of us is God's Word, which is the Word of God. And the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, it says in Hebrews 4.12. Do we live with God's sword on us? Do we go about our day-to-day -day business with it attached to us? Or have we left it at home? How can you fight without a sword? Are we seeing a theme here? It's not by your might. First of all, the theme I want to get across is be aware you and I are in a fight, a fight for our lives. Be aware that you are fighting demonic activity, spirit, evil spirits in high places, Ephesians 6 says, not flesh and blood. And be aware that you have no power against them except in his might, in God's might, in Christ's might, with his armor, in the power of his might. We overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and all these other scriptures. We're to fight, but we have to open the door to say, Yeshua, please come out and fight with my enemy. Fight for me. Fight these thoughts. Help me win. Zechariah 4, I think it is, uh, verses 6 and 7. It's not by might. It's not by power, but by my spirit. It goes on to say, oh, mighty mountain, who are you in front of Zerubbabel? He'll level you just flat and with shouts of grace, grace be unto it. You know, so when we have God's grace, there's a responsibility to take the word of God and his grace and fight against anything trying to tear us back into the old world that we came out of. I'm also learning to have more quiet time, turn off the radio, turn off the TV. If I'm going to listen to anything at all, put something like an audio Bible while I'm making the bed or shaving, or uh, might as well. Why, why have the news on? It's all depressing anyway. I'll listen to the news. I'll watch the news. Yeah. Believe you me, though, 99.9% .9 of the real news you're not even ever being able to watch. We have to have faith in God there. But don't fill your mind with songs that are depressing, sinful, evil, rap songs and things like that. Uh, that are not of God's word. Don't fill your mind with nonstop news. That's not healthy either. If you're going to have something going on, put on the put on the uh, a Bible audio or something like that. So anyway, my point is, it's by God's power that we're going to win this thing. These are the themes coming up. Sometimes we have to recognize that Satan will talk to us by the ones we expect the least for this to be coming from. One time, in, let's put it up there, Mark 8, verses 31 to 33. Yeshua was telling his disciples, I'm going to be tortured and crucified, scourged, crucified, and, and then three days later I'm going to be resurrected. And Peter has the gall to come up and say, wait, 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 no, no, that's not going to happen. 
So Mark 8, 31 to 33, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and be killed and after three days to rise again. He spoke this word openly. Verse 32, then Peter took him aside, began to rebuke him. Oh, no, no, that's not going to happen. And when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, verse 33, he rebuked Peter. He rebuked Peter saying, get behind me, Satan. That's Mark 8, verse 33. He says to Peter, but really not to Peter, but to the spirit at that moment that was making Peter tell Christ, no, you're not going to be scourged and crucified and die. That was a temptation coming from an evil spirit. And so here is Christ. Have you seen this before? Do you realize this? That he says this to Peter. Get behind me, Satan, adversary, enemy. That's what Satan means. You are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. He wasn't really even speaking to Peter at that point. He's speaking to Satan, who was putting those thoughts into Peter. And Peter let them come in instead of, instead of fighting those thoughts, saying, listen, I'm going to listen to what my, my Lord is saying. I'm not going to rebuke him and say what he's saying is wrong. No, he gave in to that. And so Jesus rebuked Satan, speaking through, of all people, Peter. So as I speak of fighting the good fight, be really, I'm really speaking about letting Christ's power and his might fight for you, in you. Let that be the power by which we send Satan scurrying away, demolishing him. For he who is in you, 1 John 4.4, 4, let's put this on the board, 1 John 4.4, 4, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So we're in the fight of our lives. We're going to win it, though. We have to be very cognizant that there's a real fight going on. If you're not aware, if you don't feel a fight going on, he's got you already. You got that? So wake up. Fight these temptations to be depressed, to be down, to be discouraged, to be lustful, sinful, angry, bitter, whatever, that are not God's thoughts. God's thoughts are Philippians 4, verse 8. Whatever things are noble and beautiful and right and good and just, true. Think on these things. So some of Satan's biggest tools include apathy, discouragement, despair, worry, cares of the world. You and I have been called to come out of that. And Jesus tells us, or Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 57, thanks be to God who gives us, who gives us, the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Our life now is in Christ. That means we're coming under him. In Matthew 7, we'll turn over there now in conclusion here. We'll finish this topic next time. Part 2 is how. How we wage this war. How we fight this fight. What are the steps? How do we come out victorious? It's through Christ. But how do we get that to end up there? That's my point. So we have to come under Christ. And so many people are telling you that all you got to do is, like the verse in Romans 10, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's true. But we have to understand that when we call upon the name of the Lord, that coming under his name means that he now owns us. And whatever he wants, whatever his will is, thy will be done on earth as it is up there in heaven. And we're asking him to help us be obedient to him. We're asking him to do the things he wants. We're asking him to live his life beautifully in us. So he says in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, not everyone who says Lord to me will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many of you will say to me in that day, Lord, well, wait a minute, I preached in your name. I prophesied in your name. I cast demons out using your name. I've done miracles, wonders in your name. What do you mean? I won't be in the kingdom of heaven. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, iniquity, lawlessness. You think you don't need to keep my law anymore. You don't think you have to keep my commandment. Remember what I read in 1 John 2, verse 3 to 6? 
if you, if you claim to know him, keep his commandments. You can't claim to know him and claim that you know him if you don't keep the commandments. What did Jesus say? I think in John, was it John 15, 14, I think it was? Or John 14, 15, I think it was. John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. So he's saying to these people, I never knew you. You can't claim to have known me just because you use my name in preaching and my I and my mercy let you have some miracles happen. Get out of here. Never knew you. There's a tough side to Christ and God the Father. I don't want to be on the tough side. It's a fearsome thing to come before the justice of God and not be on the right side of things. And anyway, I'll end it there. Know you're in a battle. Know this battle has been started now, not just with you in your life. All over America, we're watching sat satanic th thinking, demonic activity happening. It's all I can describe it. It's been so sudden, so fast. And too many people are giving heed to it. We have to stand up, speak up, stand in the gap. We have to fight the thoughts coming against us. We have to stand up for the things of God when the time comes. But the, the, the getting seasoned in the battle is fighting the thoughts that affect us right now. When the time comes that they're going to arrest you and bring you before courts and beat you up because you believe in Christ or you believe in God or you believe in law and order or you believe in the commandments and the Bible, and you're being beaten up, you're going to have to have, be a seasoned warrior by that time and know how to fight off, fight off those thoughts of God's abandoned me. So get in the fight. We need you. I need you. I need to get into it. So thank you for coming to our website. And until next time, this is Philip Shields, your brother. We'll sign off with a short prayer. Our great Father in heaven, our loving, loving Father, the God of all your ways, the God who teaches us how to love one another, that actually love is when we fulfill your law, that if we would just live by love, we would be keeping the law. We, we understand your law. We understand it's not loving to commit adultery or sex sin. It's not loving to lie, to steal, to kill, to break the Sabbath. It is loving to obey you. It is loving to realize when thoughts come our way of discouragement, depression, anxiety, and worry, and sin and evil. We just call on you now, Father, to just fill us and all who are listening with your Holy Spirit and help us know how to release that Holy Spirit to fight, to fight against sin and to come out victorious in your strength, Yeshua, in your might, with your armor of God, O oh God. Watch over your people. Watch over your children in this very terribly dangerous time we live in right now. We raise our hands in praise to you and we praise you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and his incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting, and if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.